AI and welcome back to Amazing Apps. I'm Neil Benson, Microsoft MVP and your Agile Business Apps Coach. Have you joined me on Amazing Apps before? If so, welcome back. Thanks for coming back. I appreciate you. And if this is your first time, a very special welcome to you. On Amazing Apps, I help Dynamics 365 and Power Platform Builders create amazing Agile Business Apps through my own experiences or through sharing the stories and experiences of amazing guests. In today's episode, we've got Sean Tabor. He'll be sharing insights into the world of customer experience in the manufacturing and service industries. We'll dive into the importance of integrating CRM and ERP apps, and the challenges faced by manufacturers with multiple ERPs, and how digital tools are revolutionizing customer service. Sean is a director of consulting services at Hitachi Solutions America. Uh, he specializes in the manufacturing sector. He was a founding co-host of the CRM Audio podcast, which is how I got started in podcasting. Thanks, Sean. And he's been a Microsoft MVP for ages too. Sean also touches on the need for simplicity and efficiency in managing inventory. And stay tuned as we explore real-life examples. We're going to discuss the demand for a light version of Dynamics 365 field service. And we learn about Sean's personal experiences in the world of manufacturing, customer support, and, and collectibles, which is a big part of his life as well. It's going to be an insightful episode. So let's dive right in. Here's Sean Tabor. All right, Sean Tabor, welcome to Amazing Applications. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for joining me, mate. It's been a long time. How have you been? Yeah, it's been a long time, but thanks for having me. I, I was excited when I got the invite. It's been too long. Well, since uh, we last caught up, it was a couple of years ago, you've shifted your focus a little bit. You were mm -hmm. a guru in field service. You were the host of mm -hmm. Serum Audio and then At Your Service podcast. Yep. These days, you've got a special focus on manufacturing. I don't know if manufacturers really need a CRM system. Don't, don't most of them sell through distributors? Why do they even need a CRM application in the first place? It's surprising, but that is really changing. A lot of manufacturers not only have a partner channel, right, like you're familiar with, yeah. But they're also doing a lot of their own servicing of equipment to where they need this kind of interactivity with their customers with digitizing that sales channel through a portal, for example, Power Apps portal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that CRM system becomes all that more important. Remote workers, the proliferation of that with manufacturers, you know, from a sales perspective and a right. non factory floor kind of situation, it's becoming more and more important. And business is very good. Do you think they're any good at it? Like most people have got some horror stories about a, a dreadful experience of manufacture. Let me show you. This is one of many uh, toners I've bought for my brother, uh -huh. a printer recently. It's a laser printer. It's a couple of years okay. old. And suddenly I got all these error messages. And if I contact the manufacturer, they're like, oh, yeah, just buy some genuine brother toner cartridges, please. They're only $150 mm -hmm. each. You need four yeah. of them. That's uh, $600 of toner yeah. for a $450 printer. And what it turns out, I'm waiting for, so I, had, I, I bought one that didn't fix it. I bought some more third-party ones that didn't seem to fix it. I took it to a service center. They said, oh, we, we replaced all the toner cartridges with genuine brother ones, and it, it works. What I suspect is it's, there's a battery inside the chip i don't okay. know why there's a chip but i don't know why the battery has a chip but the battery runs out the toner hasn't run out but the bat i think the battery's died so but in all of this I'm, I'm just getting the runaround from the manufacturer i'm not sure if manufacturers are geared up to provide support to end customers like me and there's lots of different manufacturers maybe they're selling business to business heavy machinery and maybe they're they can do it but uh, have you seen some world-class examples of manufacturers providing end user support or customer support I have actually, I think part of the key, and this is not to part pat a partner like ourselves at Itachi on, on our own back, but part of our job is to help them understand what that transition is from B to B to B to C. Right. Right. So we have to help them understand, you know, when you're dealing with that customer experience, that it truly is a customer experience. That's key. So your experience is not something that is foreign. I've heard that a, a bunch of times. And typically that's why we come in to help them, right? Right. The manufacturers I primarily deal with are building large equipment manufacturers. They're large equipment manufacturers, right? So we had a customer who manufactured uninterruptible power supplies, cool. big ones, like for Microsoft, Intel, okay. you know, things like that. Okay. But they were servicing those units. So stories 
you know, as we are moving through that discovery phase network, you're finding that customer experience comes into things like they place an order through a normal sales channel where you're talking to a salesperson, the salesperson's putting it into their sales app. It's going through their ERP, right? Yeah. But then things like they forget that it's a 12,000 pound unit and they can't drop ship it to an apartment <laughs> complex, things like that. Right. So you gotta, you gotta work through that and, and help them through that. We, you know, we deal with smaller manufacturers for like medical supplies and equipment. It's those similar kind of things. It really comes down to manufacturers are trying to find efficiencies in how they support their customers, how they support their products so that they can make a, a better margin, but provide the same level of support. And right. by doing that internally through a partner channel, through a, you know, an internal support team that is maybe brand new to their organization, it comes with challenges, some of which CRM solves, some of which in ERP implementation, a sound ERP implementation solves. Because a lot of times we also see you come into a manufacturer, they have 11 different ERPs, one for each little business area, right? And there's smaller ERPs, so you got to implement something larger like, a, you know, finance and operations. So it's a challenge, but um, you have to look at what level of service they're trying to provide from a digital perspective. So via a portal or from the salesperson's perspective, their digital experience and apply CRM appropriately. Yeah. You mentioned lots of different Microsoft apps there. And I'm thinking if I was to walk into... You know, a reasonable size manufacturing operation today, and they wanted a clean sweep, we'd be mm -hmm. looking at Dynamics 365 sales, probably some mm -hmm. customer service, field service, mm -hmm. if I had to go out and service equipment. I'd be looking at uh, supply chain, asset management. Mm -hmm. You mentioned um, Power Pages as well. That's a big stack. Um, and marketing. there are only a few partners, at least here in Australia, that I can think of who can deploy all of that. We don't have Hitachi mm -hmm. Solutions very much here in Australia, but that's a complicated stack to deploy. What kind of organization yes. do you need to be to go for that stack? Do people go incrementally through it or do they need to really think about it as a big transformational program? And how does that stack up against other vendors who may have more of an all-in-one solution in the market? Yeah, so sometimes it is difficult to puzzle piece it together over time. And a lot of times when you come into a manufacturer, they're wanting to just get it all done. Big bang, let's go. Yep. And you have to talk them down from that. You have to say, okay, let's look at the broader range on what we're trying to do and where are the major pain points and let's come up with a roadmap and a plan. So I have one customer, we started with customer service and sales. We have since implemented field service, marketing, Finance and operations with dual rights. We're moving into omni-channel, you know, so, but that's a customer we've had for almost 10 years. Right? Oh, wow. Okay. It's so a it's, it's a, it's, yeah, it's a long-term program. So it, it takes a lot of investment. It takes a lot of not only, and I'm not talking just dollars. It takes a lot of investment from a partnership perspective to, to get that level of understanding that level of trust that you're going to move them through. And you're right. I mean, when you're dealing with all these different apps and all, and you know, just as well as I do, they don't always just plug and play super nice and perfect, right? <laughs> it just doesn't happen. And um, I'm, I'm shocked. Yes. Yes, I know. I know. I'm, this is hot takes. So you, you have to, you have to understand what they're trying to achieve from a business perspective and model that within the ecosystem of Microsoft. And quite often you have to leverage things like fast track. You have to leverage relationships with the product team. You have to leverage that sales organization with, within Microsoft to help support that transition. Because I mean, also all of those apps become very expensive too. It's not just the services component. There's also a huge yeah. licensing piece now. You know, back in the day when we first started this, all this business, you know, you'd buy one license and you got everything you needed. And now I don't even want to talk about license. <laughs> give me a <laughs> headache. It'll give me a headache. But 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 really truly, it's it's something that you can't go in guns a blazing and say, okay, everything I'm gonna I'm gonna say every single thing, right? 
you have to be able to, especially with a manufacturer that's going through a huge transformation digitally, you have to pick your battles and you have to have a plan because if you don't, that implementation will fail and you're, it doesn't matter what you do. They'll either go to something else. Maybe they'll bring in new yeah. senior leadership and everything's, you know. Yeah. So, so do you find your that. teams are, are building temporary solutions like integrating with their existing ERP system? Let's say you're doing a new field service mm -hmm. app and you've got to go inventory and invoices are still in the, it's called the legacy ERP. So we're going to mm -hmm. integrate with that for a while. But our, our plan mm -hmm. is, you know, two or three years down the line, we're going to rip out that legacy ERP and upgrade to, to finance and operations. You, do you find there, there are staging points along the way in a, in a program that's 10 years long? Definitely, definitely. There's manufacturing customers that you can either start on the CE side or on the finance and operations side. And either way, you're looking at it from a partner perspective on how can I, for, you know, this is kind of a crude way to say it, but how can I chip away at the non Microsoft investment <laughs> and get more Microsoft investment in there? So we quite often integrate with SAP, Oracle, you know, other ERP systems while we're building the CE infrastructure that then we can easily say, well, you know, now you need asset management if you had, blah, 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 you know, to go down yeah. that path, right? Or on the other side, uh, you get a customer, uh, you get a big finance and operations deal, and then you start slowly introducing this, the sales process to get them off. And sometimes that's now done with a uh, power platform where you're integrating from FNO to Salesforce. And you're slowly yep. weaning them off, you know? Yep. So it's just ways that you have to manage that. It's on either side. But my okay. job is to make sure that we're looking ahead to where we can take advantage of those opportunities. You mentioned you can start at either the CE side or the ERP mm -hmm. side. You, know, you and I are old school CRM guys, but yep. is there a preferred approach? Or does it really depend upon the customer's situation and environment and what they're trying to achieve? Is there a way you'd recommend? Ideally, I think if all things are equal... I think if you have the ERP sound and set with your customers, with your, you know, general ledger, all of that, that is typically a better foundation to move because then you, then you know who your customers are, how you're populating the product catalog and CE, how you're yeah. managing assets, how you're dealing with inventory, all of that. Okay. Oh, so for anybody listening, who, who's thinking about making a clean sweep in their manufacturing business, start with ERP and then roll out the customer engagement apps later on? It's a longer process. It depends on your what you want your quick wins to be, right? We do it all the time the other way around. It's just, you know, there's yep. just challenges involved either way. Um, I had Mona Sorensen uh, on the podcast uh, probably seven or eight months ago talking about field service and one of the things he wished for from Microsoft if they listened to MVP's wishes in fact, oh, he was made an MVP shortly afterwards. So they don't listen to your wishes if you're not an MVP. <laughs> but um, uh, he's had a lot of feedback from the market for a light version of field service in particular. Mm -hmm. And I know I had a little customer here, a little customer. They had a, about a, they were a local services business. They do plumbing, electrical, kind of domestic jobs. They have about 100 trucks go around Brisbane. Mm -hmm. They were looking at Dynamics 365 field service and Business Central and talk about the shock of those applications not really integrating very right. easily right. and natively but the, the field service application they were only going to use a fraction of it and there isn't really mm -hmm. an alternative version of field service like there is for customer service we have professional and enterprise for field service mm -hmm. it's just field service mm -hmm. do you see a lot of demand in the market for a, a light version of a dynamics 365 field service 100 percent, 100 percent. a lot of our services customers don't need the full depth, breadth, and width of the field service application. Plus, if you look at a lot of the competitors, one thing I do, which bothers, it just bothers my wife to no end. Whenever we have someone come to the house to fix anything <laughs> or maintain anything, I'm like, hey, what's that app you're using? Let me, can I, you know, can I take a look? And they're like, would you just let them work and get them out of the house? Leave, you know, and the apps that, that uh, most services industries customers use are fairly lightweight. They're fairly easy to use. They're integrated to some kind of payment system, right? Yep. A lot of the things we don't have. So the customer could pay by the, on a credit card or with their phone. Right. In, in, in right. Us. Yep. Yep. Right. Or they could easily take a picture of a check. You know, I mean, we can do some of that, 
but not, it's not integrated to a payment system and right. the integrating to a payment system is not fun with field service. I mean, it can be done, but it's not an enjoyable experience getting at it. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, you know, a light a light version would be fantastic, especially when you have when you have those scenarios where it's very small, it's very quick, and you just want to get take payment and move on, right? It's not a situation uh, where you're maintaining assets. Right. You're it's just you, you may just be a company that's doing services for it's not your equipment, so this is not a manufacturer servicing their own equipment. It's a just a you know a HVAC company that's going out and servicing a compressor and i don't care what i'm putting in i don't care what's there i just i'm doing the service i'm doing a checkup i need to know what things i need to bring in have in my uh truck stock something simple right yeah so yeah i I, i've given that feedback as well to the product team so I, I think uh, since i had that conversation with monas our friend steve morda over at forceworks Mm -hmm. has shipped a i can't remember what's called rapid start field service probably and yeah i'd be probably. interested to take a look at that next time i have a field service requirement and see what's in there steve's got a good head on his shoulders he's done a lot with pro- the power platform since it began with yeah. his fork source forks force works products and it i mean the challenge i have with field service is if they need something simple sometimes i have to spend more time to undo the things i don't need Yes. than I am doing to make it different, you know? Yes. Yep. Hiding buttons yeah. and removing menu options and yeah, you know, adjusting all the security roles to hide tables. Yep. And, yep. Delete buttons. Yep. yep. I get it. Figuring out, figuring out how to work around plugins that are firing that I don't really need to fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's it like at Hitachi? You, you obviously got a great services business. Do you do a lot of product development? Have you got a, have you got a field service light in the works at uh, Hitachi? Or, you know, is it, is it a consulting first business and, and without kind of a, a plan to develop much of your own product? We lead with our services, but we do have an, a great innovation team that's working on a number of initiatives. Some, you know, some in the field service space, some in the customer service space. But um, uh, we have our Engage apps for right. uh, healthcare, for, for um, we, we do have a field service accelerator. Um, it's for warranty. There you oh, go. Okay. Yep. Yes. So, so we we do have some products, and uh, they are on the Microsoft thing. App source. The, there you go. God bless America. Right. Yes, it, <laughs> and they are available. <laughs> they are available on App Source. But um, we're always looking at uh, new areas to to invest. And we, from a services perspective, we work really hard to try to curate from within projects. Right. So if we're working on the same thing over and over and over again, we try to capture that, whether it's a architectural reference guidance or, right. you know, maybe mini accelerators, and then we bubble that up to our innovations team. So it's a good, it's a good process. We have a really good uh, team with the uh, innovations group. That, that's a really good discipline for any Microsoft partner to get into is, is spotting those patterns, but then you have to mm-hmm. you know, actually invest some time to get People, typically it's non-billable work, right? To harvest those resources, to make them generic enough that they're going to be applicable to lots of other customers, uh, to store them somewhere internally that other teams can easily discover and find them and and make them available, keep them up to date. And then you've got to think, if you're going to package all that to to actually be an ISV, then you need a Mm -hmm. a, professional development team. It's not a chargeable, billable customer team. So not, not many Microsoft partners have perfected that model of being both an ISV and a systems integrator at the same time. And you got to, you got to choose your, when you want to, when you want to sell the product as opposed to accelerate delivery, right? Yes. There's yep. one is not the same as the other, right? Yeah. Good point. So, so we have to look at those, those decisions wisely. So it sounds like you've got quite a bit of both uh, little features to accelerate an implementation, mm-hmm. which would be a selling point, I guess, if I'm weighing up Hitachi versus somebody else. Oh, they've got all these accelerators. They can do it quicker. They've done right. this before. Right. Well, or... and, it, and what it does is it helps when we're estimating out a project. If we have these accelerators, we can take those into account when we're estimating. Yeah. And that helps us be a little bit more competitive yeah. in the market. Awesome. Right. Talking about being competitive in the market, congratulations on your recent uh, Partner of the Year award. Thank I, you. you know, Very excited about that. You, you probably have a better idea of how, exactly how many Partner of the Year awards Hitachi has won, um, but this uh, is not your first I one. This so. is our, I think it's our fourth. Well, well done. 
Well done. So tell us yeah. about, I don't know whether it was for a, a single project that you wrote up and, and Microsoft, uh, the Microsoft judges really loved it, that project or whether it was a portfolio that you submitted. Can you tell us a bit about what led to the award this year? Yeah, it, it, it truly was a portfolio. Our, our marketing team and our services and manufacturing teams work very hard to maintain very good documentation on the things we did this year, this last year. It was a big year really truly was. We had some significant implementations across not only manufacturing, but services and healthcare with field service, omni-channel, customer service. So it really played well into that, that new combined services unit. Additionally, you know, along with the services, we were also partner of the year for supply chain, which internally, those two teams were really working more like a biz apps team than individual silos, which is really fantastic. So we're continuing to grow in both manufacturing and in its services to, to bridge that gap. So a CE architect, for example, can, they're not necessarily configuring or working in FNO, but they know enough to be able to articulate not only to the customer, but to their FNO counterpart, what it is we're talking about. We're really getting, seeing some really good progress on bridging that gap so that uh, we can be seamless there. It's exciting. That's tough because it's like oil and water trying to emulsify <laughs> oh, uh, it business is. applications consultants. It is. Good job. Yeah, it is. It's it's tough, but we've, we've been doing it slow, slow and steady ever since probably three or four years ago when we really started accelerating our field service business. More and more, we were integrating more and more to supply chain. So more and more, we were bringing those folks together. Our dev tech team really provides that technical oversight to where we can really articulate strongly those key solutions when you're dealing with, when you're dealing with integration between FNO and with, with field service. It, it's not as simple as, unfortunately, as Microsoft makes it seem. It, it's good. But it, it could be better. And, uh, you know, so we're really working to standardize how we approach that when we're dealing with dual right, when we have to go another way, when, what patterns are we using when we're integrating field service to project ops, for example, or to supply chain. Because now with things like project ops, where it's more of a dataverse duality kind of thing, it's requiring us even more and more to yeah. integrate those teams together. So. It's exciting, yeah. but it's, oh, it's, then, a, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Yeah, it's, um, there, like I said, there's not many partners um, with the kind of scale and the breadth of expertise needed. I think, of, you know, the businesses I run and, and we're very specialized, we're focused on one industry, really you know, mm -hmm. just a couple of applications. You've got a, a big portfolio of, of Microsoft applications to be able to, to implement, which is, yeah, it takes, takes a much bigger team, a bigger breadth yeah. of expertise. Good on you. Well, and we have folks on our team like, like Joe Unwin, He's our capability lead for Power Platform. He focuses solely on Power Platform to help us understand what's the best way to implement, what are the innovations coming, how do we take advantage of those? And he's looking forward. We have yeah. folks like that on the field service. The, that's my old job. The customer service, marketing, and sales. Our, Adam Piercy from our, from our team is doing amazing things with sales. It's great when you have those kind of people on your team. Bill Caldwell running that team has really, really moved the needle in terms of how we can manage looking forward while in delivery, my team is, you know, focusing on getting the projects done in the, yep. in the now. Um, but we're continually building the collateral for how we're going to do it in the future. Well, one of my favorite topics shown is no surprise is, is to talk a little bit about implementation approaches or methodologies. Mm -hmm. And I know Hitachi works very closely with the Microsoft Fast Track team who've got some guidance around yep. Yep. the success by design approach. And I'm sure mm -hmm. you follow parts of that, mm -hmm. but I'd love to know more if is there, has Hitachi got its own methodology or approach that it uses, or do you alter your approach depending upon the customer and their environment and what kind of uh, culture they have? How, how does that work at Hitachi Solutions? So we do have our own methodology. It incorporates fast track within it. So part of uh, one of our phases is, you know, the blueprint phase and that right. deals a lot with fast track, right? So we deal with fast track ongoing throughout the entire engagement. But in order for us to be competitive, 
we have to be able to pivot. And if a customer has their own framework, has their own methodology, maybe they're not agile. Maybe they you don't like Scrum. Okay, then we got to do something else, right? So we have been able to work with multiple customers with, out, with outside frameworks and difference. Our framework is very solid. It, it works very well, but it doesn't work for every customer. So we have to be okay right. with that, you know? Yeah. yeah, cool. Is there anything else you wanted to, uh, to cover, Sean? I'd love to um, just catch up a little bit more about your background. So for those who want to stay on and join uh, Sean and I in a quick retrospective, um, <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you, life after podcasting, yeah. you were the host, co-host of Serum Audio. Which I checked out. Yeah. I found it on Podchaser. It's still, the more episodes of Serum Audio than any other show, five hundred and fifty something episodes. Yeah. And then you had uh, a specialist podcast called At Your Service, uh, wrapped yep. up a little while ago. And again, another thirty five, forty episodes over there. Have, have you taken a break from podcast hosting? Are you going to come back someday onto the microphone? I have. I have an idea for a new one, but I haven't kicked anything off yet. My daughter is now a scrum master <laughs> and um she used to be a teacher and, right yeah, yeah I remember. third oh, third, wow. fourth, third grade yeah so she's now a very good scrum master and her her fiance so <laughs> so this is an exclusive her fiance works in supply chain so i've considered trying to put together like a family <laughs> dynamics podcast right <laughs> i think it would be very i think it'd be fun I think I'd drive them nuts. I think I'd say things that they have no idea what I'm talking about. But, uh, you know, and my future son-in-law wants to learn field service. So, wow, you know. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, th I'm, think I'm kicking it around, thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. But, yeah, it's been when, it, when that ended, it was weird because I was so used to doing it. Yeah. You know, and it was and I did it. It was one of those things. I didn't do it because I was trying to get MVP you know, contributions. That wasn't it at all. I was doing it because it was fun. I enjoyed it. I loved talking to people. I loved, you know, just collaborating. Even with George. <laughs> um, I'm going to see George uh, next week. I'm done in Sydney, so I can't wait to catch up with him. I legit, I, le I legit miss talking to George. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a good time. I, I really, truly do miss it. Well, uh, you guys give me my break in podcasting. I got to do the Scrum Dynamics podcast as part of the CM Audio Network for a while back there in 2017 yeah. or 18, I started. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks for giving me a shot at it, um, oh, carrying the God. torch. I, I appreciate that. It was it was something that I'll, I will always cherish that we did, and it was such an I, it's it was one of my greatest accomplishments, truly. Well, the other great accomplishment you have is as a collector, um, mm. I can't remember all the different things you collect, but you seem to have quite a you few see, uh, you see some of them. hobbies. Dude, what's the yes. latest? Okay, so I stopped collecting Funko Pops. Oh, yeah, those are little bobblehead things, yeah? Yes, it's these <laughs> little bobbleheads. So I only collect Star Wars, but I stopped doing those. Now I'm into retro gaming. So right. over here to the left, I have in my office, I have an, a Nintendo, a Super Nintendo, a PS, no, a, a Wii, a Switch, an Xbox, <laughs> an Xbox 360, an Xbox Series X, and an Xbox One, a PS5, a PS3, and a PS2. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And then I have, you know, just sprawled out. I have little Game Boy Advance cartridges all over oh. the place. And, yeah. So I've, I'm now into retro gaming. And and so have yeah. you sold down any of the other collections? Have you bought a warehouse? Where, where do you keep all this stuff? Well, in my closet in front of me is a lot of pops. And I actually <laughs> did sell about 35 pops to buy the Super Nintendo and the Super and the uh, Nintendo. So, yeah. <laughs> so I'm slowly uh, selling off some of the pops to buy more games. So uh, great stuff. But it's fun. Well, listen, it's uh, I'm not going to get to see you. I think uh, you're giving up the opportunity to meet with me at the power platform conference in Vegas in a couple of months yeah, time. You're going to be, where, where can people catch up with you next? Any, any conference plans? I'm going to try to make it to community summit. That's my intent. Whether or not I'm speaking, I'm not sure. I haven't decided, but uh, yeah, I, I hope to be there. So if I, if you see me, please say, Hey, yeah. I'd love cool. to talk to anybody. Yeah. Where's community summit being hosted this year? Oh, geez. I can't think off the top of my head. I can't either. It's not Orlando. Well, that was last no. year. Wherever it is, I'm planning on 
<laughs> okay. We'll add that into the show notes. Make sure there's a link to the Dynamics go. Community Summit this year. So if you want to catch up with Sean Tabor. Sean, thanks so much for joining me on Amazing Applications. It's been my pleasure to have you. Uh, it was way too long. So really, uh, thanks for, for coming on and joining me. Thanks for having me. Really, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks, Sean, for joining me on Amazing Apps. It was cool to catch up again with you. Congratulations again on your daughter's role as a Scrum Master. Sorry, I won't get to catch up with you at Community Summit North America. But for anybody who wants to catch up with Sean, it's the 15th to 20th of October in Charlotte, North Carolina. Instead, I'm going to be at Microsoft Power Platform Summit from the 30th of September to the 4th of October in Las Vegas. Actually, to let you into a little secret, Chris Huntingford and I are plotting very special social fundraising event. Oh, I wish I could tell you all about it. I'll let you know as soon as I can once it's been confirmed with the folks at the conference. The best way to find out about it is to join my mailing list. And you can do that by visiting customary.com slash certification. Fill in the form there and you'll be the first to receive my new guide, Considering Scrum Certification. It's for Dynamics 365 and Power Platform app builders who are on the fence or just not sure if Scrum training and certification is right for them. I'll send you the guide and I'll also send you a notice as soon as Chris and I can share our super awesome event in Vegas. It's going to be epic, as Chris would say. Oh, uh, by the way, Sean, your daughter, I'm sure she's amazing, but it doesn't look like she has achieved her Scrum certification yet. Customary.com slash certification. Pass it on, Sean. Thanks for joining me. Until next time, keep experimenting.